Hey, you all, Farmer Jesse here. Got a slightly different kind of video for you all this week uh, about compost and some of the issues we are seeing in compost. And I say slightly different because I will be joined partway through the video by my buddy Troy Hinky of Living Roots Compost Tea uh, to talk about some of the more complicated issues within commercial compost, um, including persistent herbicides and what are referred to as forever chemicals. It's just as bad as it sounds um, that we've seen pop up in some compost lately. The team and I just felt like with such a profound uptick in interest in gardening, but specifically in sort of no dig and deep compost mulching, where your plants are planted directly into compost, well, we just kind of figured it would be important to dedicate some time and energy to the many issues you may run into and how to avoid them. So let's do it. What do you call nitrogen during the day? Oh, daytrogen. That's so much better than what I was gonna, I was gonna say squiretogen. Where are you going? First things first, if you're not subscribed to this channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, you're awesome. And if you gain something from this video or any of our videos or any of our work, you can always support it at patreon.com slash no-till growers or by picking up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook from notillgrowers.com. Or we now have some merch from our podcasts and the website and all that stuff. Um, and yes, we will soon have hats back. All of that stuff supports our work. Link will be in the show notes and buying stuff from notillgrowers.com is how you support more videos like this. And also things like our new podcast series specifically for commercial composters called The Composter, hosted by the amazing Jane Murner Cynical of Earth Care Farm in Rhode Island. Jane has an incredible wealth of knowledge on compost production. And in this series, she is interviewing composters and folks in and around the industry and it's amazing. Uh, first episode is up right now, and we really hope this podcast will highlight some of the many folks who are doing great compost production and inspire a few of you, perhaps, to jump in the game uh, so we all have better access to better compost, if I'm allowed to use the same adjective twice in the same sentence. You can listen at our sister channel here or wherever you get your podcast. Okay, so let's get into the topic of not so good compost so we can get an idea of the breadth of the issue because it is wildly important. If you can't tell by the length of this video, this is especially true if you are relying heavily on compost from commercial producers, or at least just like municipal producers or whomever. Also, if you're making your own, as it pertains to things like feedstocks and that sort of stuff. Uh, first, let's talk about immature compost that you might receive. Now, a compost can be immature in different ways. It can be too nitrogenous. It can be too carbonaceous. And let's just start with composts that are still too nitrogenous. What I mean here is that the compost arrives and the nitrogen element, usually some sort of manure, has not fully decomposed yet. And this can burn up plant roots with excessive ammonia and or uh, it could potentially lead to excessive nitrate buildup in the leaves, which is not great for human health, though aphids kind of dig it. Yeah, that's not a good thing. I don't know why I said it that way. These pockets of undigested manure could also harbor pathogens, human pathogens, plant pathogens, um, and lead to groundwater pollution. It's just not what we want for our plants or our soil in that sort of undigested state. On the other side of things though, there's another way that compost can be immature and that's when they are too carbonaceous, meaning that the wood chips or whatever carbon source that the producer used or you used has not yet broken down fully um, or been screened out. This can lead to nitrogen tie up in your soil or around your plants if you're doing a deep bed of compost that you're planting into. And ultimately that just leads to poor production. Both of these are very obvious when the compost arrives. If it smells like manure, it probably has some of those undigested pockets of nitrogen. Um, if it looks and feels super mulchy, it's probably just too much carbon. Uh, for both issues, I would simply recommend letting it sit and cure. If it feels dry at all, and it usually does when it has a high level of carbon, uh, maybe add some water, maybe even like a drip line that you leave on there for a few months on a timer. Um, I don't have any recommendations for necessarily how long, just keep it wet, get it wet all the way through down into the center. If all you have access to is this sort of meh compost, I recommend ordering it in the fall and letting it sit. Uh, you can add some good microbes through a compost tea or extract to improve it a little bit. Making good compost is a whole different matter and you can watch this video here on the system we're working on um, to produce more of our own compost. And it is vaguely working. And I also talk a lot more about compost issues and the four main types of compost in the Living Soil Handbook, if you're interested in that. Um, but enough from me 
from solo me at least for now, uh, let's jump to my conversation with Troy Hinkey of Living Roots Compost Tea, where he talks about persistent herbicides and forever chemicals. Uh, before we do though, if you have anything you want to add, especially any helpful success or horror stories, um, please make sure to do so in the comment section. I find that to be very helpful and uh, I enjoy reading them, except for horror stories. That's not always the most fun thing to read. But anyway, they could be useful to somebody. All right, so here's Troy and me and a super slick new hoodie. Winking. Enjoy. Persistent herbicides is one that we hear a lot about. Can you talk a little bit about what those are and how that works? Yeah. Uh, so the three main persistent herbicides are aminopyrrolid, clopyrrolid, and picloram. Um, the most commonly used that I know of anymore is aminopyrrolid, and it's the one that uh, persists the longest. So uh, picloram was developed, that's the one that's the oldest, it was developed in the 50s, I believe, or registered in the 50s. Um, and it remains persistent, I believe, for like half a year. Uh, up to a year, whereas aminopyrrolid, which is the newest one, it can remain active for up to almost a couple of years within the soil that you're still seeing effects of it. Uh, and I read a story about someone who had tested some straw that had been stored for like three years in a barn that was still showing signs of persistent herbicide on it as well. So mm. if you've got straw that you'd baled and then keeping in a barn, it's still going to have be holding that persistent herbicide. Yeah. So persistent herbicides were developed. Uh, just to kind of go back a little bit more, um, way back when, when chemicals were first starting being used for uh, herbicides were first starting being used for farming, um, farmers were reporting that the weeds were coming back even stronger and faster. Gee, imagine that <laughs> from using chemicals. <laughs> right. So uh, scientists put their heads together in labs and developed these uh, synthetic herbicides that were going to last longer in the soil. So they persisted in the soil in hopes that they would take care of weeds for longer. Uh, they didn't consider the long-term effect of that because now those persistent herbicides remain active in the soil, on plant particles, and even after being digested by ruminants or horses. So when people have horses or livestock, they can be eating this hay, straw, or alfalfa. Those are the three main culprits. Um, persistent herbicides remain active. And then when they're pooping it out on the other side, their manure then has all these persistent herbicides. So um, you've got hay, straw, alfalfa that can be harvested and used either on land or in compost that's affected uh, and, and affecting these plants, or you have animals that are eating that and then the manure is affected by that. So in that same sense, when you're composting material, so say you put straw that's been, uh, had been sprayed with uh, some type of persistent herbicide, when you break that down, you've got the chemi- so like, if this is a piece of straw, it's coated with this chemical, you break down that organic matter, so you're concentrating the chemical that was on there because you're losing the organic matter, so you're, in essence, concentrating the chemical even more. Yeah. Uh, and these <laughs> chemicals can have effects to a plant at one part per billion, which is the same as one drop in a swimming pool. So yeah. it's really scary on how much it takes to affect a plant. And then the difficult part with that is also that when you go to test, first of all, tests are very expensive. Um, when I checked in 2020, it was $400 plus per test and you can wow. only test each. So if you're concerned about aminopyrrolid and like picloram, you have to pay $400 for the test for aminopyrrolid and then you have to pay $400 for a test for picloram. Those tests normally only go down to about five parts per billion. Uh, there's one test that goes lower. I'm not sure how low it goes, but if you have a plant that's affected at one part per billion and it only goes down, the tests only go down to five, the accountability there with somebody who may have given you tainted material, uh, there's no accountability or liability with yeah. with what's going on. So. Yeah, and the better composters are trying to mitigate that issue by not bringing in certain material like that, manure from horses that may have eaten something that had pyrrolids or that family. But yeah, that's really unfortunate. Is there any way, especially with pyrrolids, to um, test for that when you order some compost? What I usually recommend is that people do a bioassay, B-I-O-A-S-S-A, -S -S -A, and um, you can get a sample from your compost. So if you're interested in a certain compost, compost from a certain compost facility, you could get a small sample from them. 
uh, and then run that through a bioassay. So what you would want to do is take some type of starter tray uh, with four inch plugs or four inch pots just by themselves. Uh, take like six pots or a whole tray full, fill one tray with one part, one to one mixed uh, compost and a uh, potting soil with fertilizer. So I don't normally recognize, recommend getting uh, potting soil with fertilizer, but just for this case, yes. Um, so you'd fill a one-to-one -one mix with compost and potting soil with fertilizer, put that in one tray or six, 10 pots, however many you want to do. And then you have another control where you're just using the potting soil with the fertilizer in it, in the same number of pots. And then the best plants to use, to pick out seeds to grow, to test for uh, persistent herbicide, Tomatoes or beans are probably going to be the best one. Tomatoes really show. Um, beans may show a little bit earlier. Um, so you'd plant, you know, one tray of beans in your mix, one tray of bean in your beans in your control. Then you want to let them grow for three to four weeks uh, until they get about three true leaves on them. And then you want to examine and compare one to the other and see if you've got cupping or twisting or elongation of uh, stems or leaves in one or just any really weird growth patterns with that compare it to your control and if it looks like you've got funky stuff going on with your plants then you most likely have some type of uh, contamination in there and so you'd want to report that to the compost uh, facility wherever you've got your compost yeah yeah that's that's simple enough i mean uh yeah i've heard legumes are good and like you said so those are the places that you usually see it on your farm uh at least from what i've heard is that you see like your tomato plants start to crinkle sort of or your legumes start to crinkle um, and, and look off. Uh, is there, once it's on your property, do we know, like, are there many options for, for remediation? Um, using some type of carbon, so either wood chips or uh, biochar, you could mix that into the soil at a depth of four to six inches. Um, normally we're against tilling, but if you're dealing with a contaminant, you're gonna wanna till that into the soil. Um, that's gonna help to break that down a bit faster. It's not gonna remediate it all the way. Time is the only thing that's gonna really remediate it all the way. Um, you know, you wouldn't wanna be growing food crops on there. It's gonna cause issues if you are certified organic, obviously. Um, one thing that you can do is to grow plants on there. So it's good to leave it fallow, but you wouldn't wanna leave it bare fallow. You wanna have plants and roots in the ground because um, living roots and plants are gonna increase the microbial activity in the soil and those microbes are gonna to help to break down any of that contamination in the soil. So uh, yeah, either some type of carbon in the soil or living roots in there um, and just grow something like flowers or something that you're not gonna eat or grasses or something like that or improve your soil through a cover crop. You know, you're gonna be leaving it fallow anyway. So stick a cover crop or cover crop mix in there and let that eat and then away. remove the above ground biomass from that take it away from that bed yeah uh, i honestly don't know once you remove that what the best where you're supposed to dispose of it i mean i imagine you'd have to pay to take it to the landfill I, and i don't know if that's considered hazardous waste or whatever there we go yeah. hazardous waste here um okay yeah yeah that's so then there's another one that's kind of come up recently which is the pfas yeah. Per and polyfluoroalkyl uh, chemicals. So these are, they tend to be like flame resistant, water resistant, uh, uh, heat resistant chemicals that are used for a lot of times for those purposes, for like outerwear or for like, like uh, waterproof things or fireproof things, a lot of like fireproof foams, um, that sort of stuff. Um, and it generally wouldn't be a problem with compost, but we've seen a couple stories in the last few years where it started to pop up that it's been traced back to compost. So can you talk a little bit about that and what that issue is and what the concerns are? Yeah, uh, so there's these things called, it's PFAS, if you wanna look it up. They're uh, originally made by 3M. Um, it started in the 1930s, but we're just now realizing the depth of the, the issues with these PFAS and PFOAs. In compost, um, one of the things that one of the things that's bringing it into compost um, are certain compostable, uh, what are supposed to be compostable uh, food service ware. So, like uh, things that you would have for takeout containers. Like you said, um, these chemicals are made 
a lot of them are water resistant so if you incorporate them into a shell that you're putting food into it's going to help resist that wa moisture that you're going to have in your food um, so then you go to compost those and you incorporate these forever chemicals into your compost and yeah they're forever forever chemicals they stick around forever they bioaccumulate in the soil they bioaccumulate in people's bodies so they have even found it in people's blood in the rain um, the one podcast I was listening to said they found some in polar bears. Wow. So yeah. it's all over now. It's everywhere now. Yeah. And yeah, it's kind of like the new lead or asbestos of our generation. Like it's a big, it seems like it could be a big deal because it's been linked to various cancers, liver diseases. So it's, it's definitely a concern. And I've seen, we've seen recently where it's popped up in a few composting operations. Um, so that's, I don't know if there's much of a way to, uh, you know, mitigate that issue if you're trying to buy in compost beyond knowing that the composter themselves is aware of it and is reducing the feedstocks that they're bringing in that could be contaminated. Um, I know that's a little bit difficult, but, uh, you know, by and large, I think there are ways to mitigate it um, by adjusting your feedstock. And one of them is like biosolids. It's found in a lot of biosolids. And so if you're buying at truly organic compost, like NOP compliant compost, uh, they can't use biosolids because that's against the national organic program. Um, so that could be you, one way to get around, get away from uh, running into this issue, I think. Is there anything else that comes to mind? No, the, yeah, the main thing is gonna be avoiding <clears throat> certain feedstocks. So like you said, paper mills. So um, that's why when we talk about composting paper, people say it's normally okay to compost uh, regular uh, non-glossy paper, but glossy types of paper are gonna be water resistant and they're likely to have had this chemical sprayed on there. And the same goes for cardboard then too, right? Like glossy cardboard. Glossy boards. cardboard, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, avoiding uh, glossy papers, anything that you think that might be contaminated. Um, and that's where you run into an issue because a lot of times you've got a compost collection service and so they're not even you know, part of the composting facility. So you've got two people who are really having to watch their feedstocks or, you know, a composting, a compost pickup service who are having to limit or tell their customers, you know, really watch out for this stuff. And then it all comes down to education with all this composting, uh, you know, food scraps and things like that is people need to know what can and cannot go. So um, yeah, it's basically comes down to controlling feedstocks. So that's gonna come down to educating people. And you had mentioned, you know, like asbestos and lead, uh, which have been issues that we've, humans have dealt with and made laws and regulations for. And I was listening to a scientist talk on one of the podcasts and he was saying, you know, like lead, it's one element. So you're dealing with one element, whereas these, uh, the latest that they had heard or counted, there were 9,000 and some of these PFAS and PFOAs in those, uh, each one is made up of up to 4,000 chemicals. So you're not dealing with just lead, you're dealing with all kinds of chemicals. So they're, they're just learning like how to, how to identify them before they can learn, you know, they have to identify them before we know how to handle that and treat those things in the future. So yeah, it's, it's becoming an issue more and more. And yeah, there was a farmer, I think you may have listened to that too, uh, in Colorado who no, sorry, it was Maine. Uh, There's two different farms I'm thinking of. One was in Maine who, uh, he was a farmer who had been get, getting biosolids from the government as part of this government program, um, and then ended up having to shut his entire operation down because yeah. of the PFAS. He was a dairy farm, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah that's really tragic. If you're purchasing compost, you wanna ask a lot of questions of your composter, you know, like, are you accepting horse manures or any other type of manures? If you are, if they say yes, you know, ask them, have you tested those horse manures for persistent herbicides? Have you run bioassays on that manure? Um, just ask a lot of questions whenever you're purchasing compost. Um, you know, and if the composter isn't able to answer a question or just kind of seems a bit dumbfounded, then maybe it's not the compost for you to buy. <laughs> yeah, I always say that yeah, you should buy your compost from the nerdiest person you can. Totally. If they want to geek out on the phone, that's probably a good person to buy your compost. If you from. can't shut them up about compost, you probably want to buy compost <laughs> from them. Yes. That's perfect.
Well, thank you, Joy. You're welcome. All right. Of course, there is so much more to be said about compost, from microplastics to finding syringes and underwear in your compost. Yeah, it can get a little weird. But if you enjoyed this video, make sure to follow Troy on Instagram and all the places. Uh, we'll give you some links in the show notes, and you'll hear more from Troy soon and other projects. Subscribe to this channel. Like the video if you like the video. Make sure to subscribe to the Composter podcast as well, wherever you get podcasts. I'm being kind of demanding right now. Last thing is merch and the Living Soil Handbook, both of which are available at notillgrowers.com. And the last thing, number two, is join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash notillgrowers. Other than that, thank you all for watching. We'll see you later. Bye. When it's a recurring cat, it's not called a cameo, it's called a catmeo. How many subscribers do you think I just lost?